<laughs> A-Hole Productions. Behold the source wall. Behind it is the single greatest secret of the universe. This is as far as I dare to go. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Source Wall. And today we are covering DC fandom. And yes, I mean we, because I am not here alone. Uh, so I want to thank Gene Hoyle. Gene Hoyle, say hello to everyone. Introduce yourself and tell them where they can find you on social media before we jump into today's episode. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, as you said, my name is Gene. Um, I'm the host of Nerd Nation Radio, a podcast that's currently in hiatus, but coming back soon. Uh, if you Google search Nerd Nation Radio, we can be found on most podcast aggregates. I'm also an independent comic book creator and publisher. Um, currently, we are looking for submissions for Nerd Nation Presents. If you're a writer or an artist or a colorist or any of those things, contact me at genesplice 71 at yahoo.com for information on that. Absolutely. It's a blast having you again. Thanks for coming back for another episode. And everyone out there, yes, if you're an artist or writer, please contact Gene. Look him up. All of his information is down in the description box below and help him make some great comic books. Yes, and we are back for our final episode of our DC fandom coverage. Uh, today we are going to talk about Milestone Comics returning to DC. So this is kind of our comic book focused one because there wasn't a ton of comic news out of here. And there's a reason why. They actually split DC fandom up into two events now. So we went through day one and that was mostly entertainment stuff outside of comics with a little bit of comic news. And then I think DC fandom day two will be more interactive with the fans, the community of fans, um, talk about more of the comics and things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today too and when that's going to be. But first, let's dive into, we're going to talk about Milestone, then John Ridley's Batman miniseries, and then we'll touch on Three Jokers, which comes out, uh, or which probably by the time this episode goes up, came out already. Uh, so uh, so we're going to talk about all that today. So, so let's start with Milestone, because Gene, I know you and I both have big opinions about Milestone coming back. Absolutely. Um, and it's funny because two or three times in the past, let's say 12 years, they've made announcements about Milestone coming back. And I think this one's the one that's actually going to stick and that's actually going to happen. Um, I'm glad. This is a, a universe of characters that really deserve to be out there and to have stories told about them. And in this day and age where, where the the diverse audience of comics is, is more diverse than it's ever, ever been, a, a universe like the, the Codiverse definitely needs to be out there for young readers to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember when these characters, vaguely remember, because obviously my mind's a little choppy, but um, I believe, or at least I have a memory salvaged of a, a, a comic shop in Jacksonville, Florida, where I, I was living, I think, in 92 or whenever Milestone came out. And I remember buying uh, uh, the, uh, the Icon and Rocket comic. Uh, or Icon number one, and also the Static number one. And in fact, I have all those number ones still, um, some of them which were signed, uh, because I, I end up working in some regards with some of the people that worked on this on this series, on these various series. Um, but uh, I had some of them signed, but I have all of them, and I they each came with a little poster, and you put all the posters together to make a giant milestone poster. Uh, nice. Which was really awesome. So, yeah, I actually did work on uh, the... I worked at BET uh, uh, for a while and my you know boss's boss there uh, but who I m met and talked to a lot about comics was uh, Reggie Hudlin who I'm a big fan of I love Bebe's kids I love a lot of the movies he's made um, the guy's amazing he's super, super talented great producer great uh, creative guy and we would nerd out about comics and then years later I would end up going to work at Golden Apple Comics and he was a customer there of all things and so we got to continue our friendship and our nerd conversations. Um, amazing dude, really awesome. So I'm glad that him, Mark Bernardin, uh, Phil Lamar, Jim Lee, all these guys came out, uh, Dennis Cohen, they all came out and they announced that they are bringing Milestone back and they're gonna be doing some digital releases uh, where they're gonna re-release the old classic stuff in digital form, which I think is amazing. Um, I think that's going to help get new readers involved with that. Uh, they're going to release some uh, direct-to-graphic novel forms of books, like Static and Icon and Rocket was mentioned. There's going to be a potential Static Shock TV show or movie of some kind. They hinted at a lot of things, but it looks like they're finally taking this universe seriously again after, you know, which is a bummer because I wish Dwayne McDuffie was still alive to see this um, grow like this. Now, Dwayne did a great job when he was writing Justice League after Brad Meltzer. He brought the Milestone characters back briefly in Justice League, which I thought was great. 
Um, but we haven't really seen them. We haven't seen a lot of them in years. I think Static Shock was the last one in New 52. So this is exciting for me, man. I'm really pumped for this. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, and Static was clearly the breakout character, having been, you know, been in other forms of media other than comics. And uh, I think that character really could be again. He could really break out in a big way right now. Uh, I liked him. I, I was particularly fond of Hardware. You know, very mm-hmm. kind of Superman slash Iron Man kind of thing going on there. Yeah, hardware is cool. I kind of rock it. I really love because of the dynamic of a of a guy who is like Superman but needed motivation, and he got it from a girl who was struggling with a drug addiction. Right. Um, and it was just I don't know. It was really interesting. I just it's just a dynamic. It didn't feel cliche. I was like, this is neat. It's it's just a different approach. And Static, you're right. That's probably the closest. He's Miles Morales before Miles Morales came out. Like uh, exactly. I, yeah, he had a, there was. DC has tried a couple times to get someone who's like a, a the spirit of Spider-Man and have that kind of fresh perspective and, and feel very like a real teenager. And Static was. Like when he first came out, he maybe was a, a, a little more hardcore, but then kind of eased up over the course of the series. And then the cartoon came out and made him a household name. Then he popped up in the Justly cartoon and Batman Beyond. And there's all this great stuff with Static. And he really did. He, he, he shined the brightest, no pun intended. And, uh, and I am so glad to see that because I remember what we reviewed for New 52, we reviewed Static number one uh, when they re- brought him back and both you and I didn't like it and we found out later why and it's because the, the writer apparently had a trouble holding a rein on the book because the artist and DC were, I guess, making it hard for that writer to tell really great Static stories. Yeah, they did some really weird things in that book too. Like, you know, he got his hand chopped off or something if I recall correctly. Yeah, something dumb like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just like, "Wow, why, why are you doing this to this character? Because he is fun. Give, give us some fun static stories." I'm actually also very curious, and uh, you know, I won't get into this a whole lot because this is not that kind of show. But um, I wonder that a character, a universe filled with um, primarily African American characters, how that will work in the current environment as far as will they deal with real life stuff that's happening right now. You know, it's always it's it's funny because I, I think that that could be a good place like for that like you know static giving static the perspective of a teenager who's black in today's society you don't have to hit people's you know over the head with it you know like I mean obviously you don't have to do that I, I prefer when comics don't do that but you can still address it because comics although maybe not always been political they do um, sometimes uh, deal with uh, the world that's happening around them. And, right. uh, and they always reference that to some degree. And I think Static, like I always thought that with Miles, Miles in the animated world at least, his dad is a cop. And I'm kind of wondering how does a kid who has a, who's black with a, a father who's a, a police officer, how does, how is that family dynamic in this day and age? You know, and, right. uh, and so Static is, is a character where you can, you can filter those kind of ideas through it because that's how a kid who is you know, African American who's at that age at this time in the world, that's how they do see the world. They feel like they are, um, that there is a force out there against them. And, right. uh, and, and you can't deny that if they feel that way, it's a real feeling and it, and it washes over teens throughout this generation like that. So I think that's a good place too, even if you just do an issue or two on it. It's a good place and a proper place to address that kind of stuff. So you're right. A universe that is primarily with that, what does their what does that world look like? And I'm I'm honestly I I hope they touch on that at least enough. Like I said, don't beat us over the head with it, but certainly I feel like you have to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I'm looking forward to it. I like I like all those characters again. Um, this is a good time for that to happen. It's a great time for that to happen and I hope it's successful. And I love, I mean, I'm a huge Dennis Cohen fan. Really, really big Dennis Cohen fan. So anything he's involved with, I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, if you guys are listening to this, I'm actually going to put images up on screen of this little preview thing that came out called uh, Milestone Zero, or Milestone Return Zero. And it looks like it's uh, just like a little preview book that's hopefully coming out in print form. I'd love to own this, but it might be a digital thing only. I'll put a link down below to the blog for uh, you know for where I got this from too, so you can see the other pages. But there's a Jim, I think it's a Jim Lee drawn icon and rocket, which is awesome. And then there's also a great image of Static. So I'll have those images pop up during 
are dis or hopefully have already popped up during our discussion here. But go check out the links down below so you can see more. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for all that. And so this is great, and that does dovetail into it, uh, into this next part about John Ridley, who's a very famous uh, writer who wrote uh, 12 Years a Slave, very talented guy, and is coming in to write, finally, it's coming out, the other history of the DC Universe, which focuses on uh, minority characters. Um, which is going to be really great to read about, I think. And I think he's focusing on Black Lightning and other stuff and other characters. So I'm curious to see what he's going to do with that. That's coming out in November. But he also announced that he's going to be doing a Batman miniseries. And it's still up in the air whether it's going to star Bruce or if it's going to be... Uh, uh, well, what's Lucius Fox's son's name? Is it Luke? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, it's like we're, we're still... I, we don't know all the details yet as of this recording. Um, but I'm curious to see what John does with not only his other history of DC, but with this as well. I think uh, it's always good to have people from different perspectives. And I don't just mean race and sex. Like, I like just people who think differently writing these characters. How does a guy like John Ridley with his mindset write a Batman story? I'm curious to see what that is. And same with like, if a, a, a rising female uh, writer out there um, or anyone, if they just think differently than the average per like James Tinian is writing Batman right now. And although it's neat, I feel like, okay, it's Joker war. It's just a big event. It's like all these, like all these writers think alike. They just like, they want to tell this big 20 issue epic. And they think that everything they write is just the gold standard of, of, of everything. And I'm just kind of like, I'm over that. I want someone to just come in and tell really great intimate stories. And I think and hope that's what John Ridley is going to do here. I agree completely. Yeah, uh, there's also something interesting about the um, the other history of the DC Universe I'd like to get into, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead, please. If um, if you guys are around, right around the, er the period of Crisis on Infinite Earths, um, you you know there was a book called The History of the DC Universe, which was a two-issue prestige format thing. Um, it was done by Perez and Wolfman basically to try to explain the new continuity of DC as it, you know, as it was changed for the crisis. Right. Now, this particular story um, was not written in comic form. It was, um, there was a lot of prose stuff with pictures on each page. Now, um, I just read an interview where they were saying that this book is going to be almost exactly like that. Whoa, really? Yeah, so we're not looking at a comic book comic book. Um, if you look it up, I don't know if it's available digitally, Zeke, but the history of the DC Universe, the two-issue prestige format thing, is something you really need to get a look at before this new book comes out. Because it's, it's so neat. there would be like this, this you know, a, a four or five paragraph thing about Wonder Woman and Paradise Island, and then there'd be this gorgeous George Perez drawing of, you know, of, of Wonder Woman and Paradise Island. It was a great, great book, which is also being collected into trade form, I believe. I'll have to hunt that down because that sounds like something I, I probably looked at when I was a kid and saw very little artwork and said, nah. Um, but now as an, a, a, an adult who can read more than three sentences and not get bored, I would I'd probably be into that. So that sounds pretty neat. And uh, that's cool that he's going to follow a similar format. I, actually, that's really smart. I like that it makes it a bookmark to, um, to that book or like a bookend to that because I am a huge fan of that book. I still have the individual issues. And to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only person I know that does. <laughs> and I love it. I love it all the time. It's just beautiful to look at, even. Nice. Well, I, I mean, John Ridley doesn't need my well wishes. The guy's talented enough as it is. But I'm curious to see what he's going to do with this, uh, with the Batman miniseries. I, it doesn't matter to me what version of Batman he's writing. I mean, I do sometimes roll my eyes when it's like, hey, you're, you know, you're a black guy. You should write a black character. You know, like there's... With Milestone, it's different because it's like it was black creators going, hey, there needs to be more characters, and they and they formed their own thing, and they, and they made their own stuff. So that that's a little different. But to me, I'm like, I see that a lot of nowadays where they're like, oh, you know, you're a, a woman, you should write a woman a character. And you're the, and it's like, well, sometimes I want to see, like, I think they did this recently with Becky Cloonan and stuff. Like, I want to see a woman write Punisher if she's interested. I know uh, Punisher Warzone was directed by a woman. Um, right. And sometimes I like that because it's like, it just does it. It just brings in a new look to a character. So I prefer and hope that John Ridley's writing a Bruce story, but if he's not, I'm still intrigued because the guy's very talented. And I'm uh, now you just got me more excited about the other history of DC universe. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I remember um, not too long ago, 
there's a run on Deathstroke the Terminator d- written by Christopher Priest. So good. And uh, this was a couple years back. And the really funny thing about that was he said, when because DC didn't just say, hey, you want to come write Deathstroke. Right. They said, hey, you want to come write something for us? And he says, yes, as long as it's not a black character. Right. Yeah. Because he's like, you know, he didn't want to be pigeonholed into that, which I totally respect. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I, 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 I don't like that mentality where it's like, oh, you – you can't write this character because you can't identify with them. It's like, but that's what writing is. Writing is research and learning and finding out stories that help you form a story. So yeah, sometimes you can write like it. You can write a character badly uh, that isn't your same race or you can't identify with. But you can look at all the great comics we've gotten in the past. You know, they weren't every black character wasn't written by a black writer. Every white character wasn't written by a white writer. So it's like, and every man wasn't written by a woman, and vice versa. So to me, it's like anyone who has talent can, can do the research and find a good voice for these characters and tell good stories. It doesn't matter. So I like that Christopher Priest said that. I remember that interview with him, and uh, I'm so glad he landed on Deathstroke because he was the only reason I bought that book. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it was good. Um, awesome. So now with that, uh, we talked Milestone, we talked John Ridley's Batman and other DC Universe. Last thing I want to talk about, because it's out now as of, not when we're recording this, unfortunately, because I would love to read it with you right now and, and review it with you, um, but maybe we'll come back and do that at a later time. But th- Batman Three Jokers, uh, by the time you guys are hearing this episode, it will have been out on the shelves. So hopefully you went out and bought it and are checking it out. But since we haven't read it yet and it's not available now, Gene, what do you think of this book? Are you excited for it? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on the idea and the concept that there are three Jokers out there? When the first when the concept was first mentioned, you know, Batman's sitting in the Mobius chair and, and he finds out about the Joker. Um, it, I was like, at my at first reaction was like, what? Why do you mean there's three Jokers? Uh, to me, as long as it ties into the multiverse, I'm okay with it. I don't want three Jokers that happen to live on the same Earth that all became the Joker. Uh, so I hope that's not what we're looking at. Um, I mean, I don't know. There's so many possibilities to what this book can be because there's nothing out there about it, you know. Um, no, this this book has been worked on by Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok for two years now, and still no one knows a dang thing about it other than that it stars Bruce Wayne, Joker, or it stars Bruce Wayne, Batman, uh, Joker, Red Hood, and Barbara Gordon. Yeah, now there's one interesting thing that I thought about. Maybe there's not three physical Jokers. Okay. Maybe Joker has a personality disorder, multiple personality disorder. Oh, so there's just three in his head. Right, and different ones pop out at different moments, which explains all the different ways he's been written. Well, I mean, yeah, because there could be a Joker that was like, hey, let's cut off our face, and then he does, and then the other one of the other Jokers comes to and goes, what the hell happened to my face? <laughs> yeah, all, all I want to do is, is they make some smiling fish. What the hell's going on here? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's actually a, a pretty... I never even thought of that possibility, so that, that could be something to where he's just got a splinter in his mind to where the Mobius chair recognizes that there's there's three essential souls inside Joker. Right. It could be. I mean, that's neat. That's a neat thing to think of. Because anyway, the, my follow-up question, if I sat in the Mobius chair and said, you know, tell me who the Joker is, and then the, if the Mobius chair, which in the comic it did, it goes, which one? There's three Jokers. I would immediately have said clarify that <laughs> like what do you mean three jokers <laughs> um because yeah, that's why the, yeah that, that's why you know anytime there's always like this ask me any question i'll give you the answer they would answer in these stupid ways and i was wondering myself why do you do that just get get the guy a damn answer you know tell him what happened right exactly um well you yeah. gotta be you gotta be specific when you're when you're making a wish from a monkey's paw um, yeah exactly <laughs> you'd also think though that batman the minute he found out that there were three Jokers, he would have done something about it. But it's been like five years. <laughs> well, that, I think that's the thing was that I think this book was obviously meant to come out right after that. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think Jeff was really focused working with Gary Frank on um, on Doomsday Clock, and uh, I, then which that was also supposed to wrap up and end sooner. So unfortunately, you know, because Jeff is you know, either very busy or just can't, you know, having trouble juggling stuff or whatever it is. Cause even his Shazam book that I was reading was, it was way behind. It's finally wrapping up next issue with Superboy prime coming back. Um, so it's like, it, it's, he's a great writer. I love his stuff. I know there's a lot of drama in the real world going on with him. I know me and you are biting our tongues cause we're waiting to see more information regarding that. Um, 
but uh, but still, I love him as a writer. He's fantastic. Doomsday, Doomsday Clock was amazing. I, I'd never thought a follow up to Watchmen would be worth reading, and I was because before Watchmen sucked so badly. But this was actually really decent. It was a great love letter to Superman, and I'm excited for this. But I, I think clearly this was meant to happen earlier, and because it didn't, because it didn't happen before Rebirth, which it was supposed to, now it's considered uh, uh, not really canon. It's like a black label book. Uh, right, right. So it's drifting continuity, which kind of upsets me. But at the same time, I guess that depends on the story. Maybe it's designed to be this way, and if that's so, then maybe it'll work out well. And I guess, I guess, hopefully, we'll find out soon. We should pretend because we're we're this is coming out after the book comes out. We should pretend we already read it. <laughs> Talk for a minute. <laughs> oh man, can you believe Jason Todd died, and there's actually thirty Jokers? I can't believe that Joker number twenty eight is actually Bob Hope. And Joker 29 is Bob Ross. He wants to draw some happy smiles on people. <laughs> oh, man. Too bad Joker 32 isn't Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Uh, if, if you if you didn't listen to that episode earlier, I swore I would not make another De- uh, Napoleon Dynamite reference, and then Gene made me laugh at the end of the episode, so I, I wanted to do one more. But I did a very, that was a very lazy uh, reference. We can keep that going if you want to. I mean, that's totally up to you. <laughs> no, it's good. We got to wrap this up. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, we read it. Three Jokers is amazing. It's the best book ever. So go buy it right now. Um, and uh, and yeah, it, 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 one of the Jokers, one of the Jokers is gender fluid. So we have that too. <laughs> can, I, can I throw a quick shout out to someone? I know it's unusual. But there, there's something that just happened, and I'm very happy about it. Please, yes. Uh, I've been working with a friend of mine named Eric Cockrell, um, who his, his company is Studio Urbo. Um, he has a um, Kickstarter coming out for a book called Blister, which is basically about um, the punk lifestyle in the 90s and him growing up in that, in that. But anyway, the important thing is I wrote a book for him called Dulce, which is a um, workplace comedy set in a secret alien base. And just now, as we're talking about Three Jokers, I got a box with my comp copies of number two in the mail, so I'm very excited. Dude, awesome. So uh, send me a link to anything that's regarding that, and I will put that in the description box so people can go check it out. Great. I'm not sure exactly when the case started or starting, but I'll, I'll find out for you, and I'll, I'll get you that link ASAP. No problem. So if you guys are listening to this episode fresh and that link isn't up now, um, you know, hopefully if you're listening to this episode later, I'll have that link down. I'll put. I'll make a pinned comment down below with it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that whenever he when he did the first two um, Kickstarters for Dulce, uh, he did that thing where you could go to his main page and it would take you to the Kickstarter. And I'm pretty sure that would be stu- Studio Erbo, E-R-B-O, dot com. Awesome. So either way, I'll put that down below so you guys can check that out. And whenever the link does drop, um, not only will I update it here in a pinned comment, but I'll also um, put it on my community board so people can see it on my community board on YouTube here. Sweet. Awesome. So thank you. And then, uh, and last, you know, before we go, we're going to talk about real quickly DC Fandom Day 2. We don't have much information on it. They t- t- talked a little bit about some panels. Like I said, it's going to be interactive with, you know, more interactive with fans where they can kind of help create the experience. It's called like dipping into the multiverse or something like that. Um, it's going to be on September 12th. So, you know, when that happens, if there's some great information that comes out there, we probably won't have enough to make nine videos like we did this week or eight videos, <laughs> however many we did. Uh, we probably won't have that much content, you know, but if we have a couple, you know, maybe me, uh, Gene and I can reunite and we can do this again and make like, you know, two or three episodes uh, after that show. We're reunited and it feels so good. Feels so good. So, Gene, thanks for spending a whole week with me making these episodes, uh, sharing our love for DC with the people out there. And hopefully you guys, if you aren't DC fans or you're not as big DC fans as we are, hopefully you become one because I got to say, I agree with Gene. This thing made more noise and more tr- it got trending more. It This did better than Comic-Con did. And I think what message that's going to send to AT&T as the people who own uh, DC now is they're going to say, look, we don't need to pay money to go to these events. We can just do our own event. And uh, and I think that sends a, that's going to send a strong message. So it's going to be really interesting to see the climate of cons next year. I'm sure DC will still have some kind of presence at Comic-Con, um, but it'll be interesting to see what level they go to and if they just decide to do a live DC event next year, which would be amazing if they did that. Yeah, and maybe, maybe Marvel will shape up too because... Uh, they did the whole thing where, like, we're going to show all our stuff at D23, and it's always been a resounding, like, and meh. 
Um, I want to see them step up their game and do what DC did with the with this fandom event. And in general, since this is our last fandom episode, I will say this is absolutely the way to do to do it. This is how you do it, DC. Keep doing this. Other companies do the same thing, and uh, it'd be awesome. It really was. I mean, this was great. I mean, of course, the pan the actual live show where everyone was on a green screen and stuff, and it was cool because it was like Jim Lee did a lot of the artwork. He designed like the Watchtower, and they're all standing in the Watchtower, or whatever. It was neat. It's a neat concept, but of course, it was like full of goofy dad jokes and, and silly things like that. That you're just kind of, and they're saying like, you know, just typical, you know, sh you know, um, corporate, sp you know, talk and stuff. But the actual footage they showed, the trailers they put out there, the way they uh, got fans excited, and the the artwork they put out there, the announcements they made, that is the way to do it. Like Gene said, and it really. It feels good. Like I, I made the joke the other day to my mom because I collect a lot of DC figures, like the Spin Masters and the McFarlane ones. And when I tell people, like I'm a bigger DC fan than Marvel, I used to say that proudly. And then the past like year or so, I've gotten more quiet about my DC love. And I and when people go, who do you love more, DC or Marvel? I go drugs, because <laughs> because I'm actually less embarrassed to tell people that I'm addicted to drugs than being a DC fan, <laughs> which, which is actually just a, I'm, I'm joking, of course. Uh, that's a joke from the Rush Hour movies. Um, but still, I it's nice to see this and the reaction and people getting excited for DC video games, movies, TV, and comic books again. It's a really good time to be a DC fan. And if you aren't one already, now's a good time to jump on the bandwagon because there are, seems to be no stops ahead. Yeah, and, and DC, do do as good as, as you did with this when you do the comics. Give us some news. Give us some excitement. Give us some new creative teams on your books. And, and you know, make sure you let us know that Pete Tomasi needs to be back on Superman. And we'll be all set. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, yes, yeah, so hopefully they knock it out of the park with DC Fandom Day 2. And we will hopefully reunite after that show and do more of these episodes. So, Gene... Dude, I can't thank you enough. It, it took a lot of time for us to, to make all these episodes today and spread them out over this week. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of time out of our day. And it means a lot to me that you spent this time with me because you're one of my dearest friends, and uh, and I'm glad to share your passion with the people who listen to this show. And if you guys out there love what you heard here, especially from Gene, check out his links. Become a fan of this guy. Become a friend of his. He's an awesome dude, and uh, he's really great to talk to, and he's he's just one of the best people in the world. Gene, Thank you enough. I can't thank you enough, man. You've, you've been great. Please, please be my friend. <laughs> Won't you be my friend? <laughs> and uh, on that note, we will see you guys later. Thank you so much. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. We'll see you in the future. Peace.